So um, my mum is from Eastern Africa, Malawi. My grandfather originated from India. He moved over to Africa for trade. And um, there was a lot of instability in Africa during the late 60s. And they decided early 70s that they were going to move to um, the UK. My grandfather, um, well, my mum was the first one over. She came over in 71 and she got to the UK. Um, with just a suitcase and yeah she she you know my father she met um early 80s i was born in 85 my dad tried to stab my mom tried to kill me whilst i was in her womb he stabbed her through her stomach um, in order to kill me um he was unsuccessful my mom's a fighter um, single mom they divorced um, my dad was very very violent and extreme uh, he originated from pakistan and um my mum went at it on her own so i was pretty much exposed to everything that came with it um single mother in a borough predominantly white and black um, my mum was the only asian person I remember being one of the only asian people in the whole estate there was hardly any um asians about and yeah growing up in a in an area where it was predominantly black and and white um, i was subjected to a substantial amount of racism um, and and you know, by being around people who were misguided from young. There were a lot of people who were exposed to crime, a lot of single parents raising up children and single mothers, council estates. So yeah, the people that I grew up with, my friends that grew up with me, they were all exposed to youth violence and gangs and we all eventually progressed and, and um, rose up in ranks of crime eventually, you know, being involved with gangs and yeah and um, seeing old, all my friends how old were you when you joined a gang oh, man um well, it wasn't really just joining a, a gang as we were growing up i mean 14 13 14 um going on to about 14 to 15 years old i was very much involved with with gang lifestyle it was just influencing crime it was all our friends that were around us they all had their hands involved with some sort of crime my my unique um aspect that i brought to the table was being um you know accessing weapons and getting hold of weapons um my mum got remarried um when when um, I was in about year seven of school and um, she got remarried and yeah very much uh, so went to Pakistan <laughs> associated with with really really crazy people out there Get, um, you know on our first proper holiday we went out to Pakistan and I ended up meeting people you know who, who got hold of weapons for me I had a lust for weapons because I knew what I was going to do with them when I brought them back to the UK um, got involved with with uh, a lot of gang uh, affiliation with with a lot of fights from people from different areas targeted attacks on people um, stealing from people because we didn't have money um, herd like mentalities going after other areas and going after people that were more vulnerable um, and yeah the, the culture and the ideology of being able to to enforce a level of anger and hate towards people in such forms of violence and um, being one of the only Asian people in in a group of of loads of black and white people, so yeah, kind of stuck stuck out, you know. What sort of weapons? Uh, we're talking knives. We're talking guns. We're talking mainly um, the type of weapons that I used to get a hold of when I was younger were mainly knives. So I was one of the main suppliers in that school at the end of the road that I just pointed to. Of, of weapons, um, regular import, importing them from Pakistan and realizing afterwards that the people that I was trading with were Taliban. <laughs> so uh, as you grow up, you, you tend to realize, and I was a kid then, so didn't choose to just uh, trade with people. Was eventually these people came to my understanding of who they were. And um, yeah, very much involved with crime at a very young age. So, and, uh, Raheel, you talked about the gang structure and that you rose through the ranks. What do you mean by that? Raising through the ranks of gangs, is, it's, it's not like an army. It's not in the same way, you know. And some people 
it's all it's all about um, doing things in the moment and getting ratings. Ratings were the things that that made people um, made people stand out as fearful characters, as as people that you didn't really want to mess with. And the more ratings you've got, the less likely you are to have people mess around with you. The more likely you are to get jobs, heists. Um, I was getting a lot of jobs to do heists with, with people as a young teenager and um, going out there and doing loads of crime. So you know, it's normally who gets called first and who normally gets the job. And similar to what you see like a tradesman get jobs. The same thing, we're trying to get get onto moves. It was mainly what's called moves because you're going to move to do a move. Um, going out there looking for a crime to commit, things that will be lucrative. So we all had our hand in it, and um, you know, to be raised in the ranks is normally the most trusted person to either get the job done, or the person that's normally the most violent to ensure that they would do the crime and not spill the beans to the police. You've been, uh, uh, you've already talked about these experiences publicly, but you went to prison, and then something changed inside prison. Yeah, it's a bit of a. It's a crazy story. So um, I, I was associated with some criminals from Ilford and um, he had an altercation with someone else and I got involved with that altercation as his muscle. I went down there with him, uh, ended up having um, a fight with someone. Um, um, I punched him in his face and his face broke subsequently from that punch was always involved in fighting or some sort of martial arts or I was really strong so when I hit that person and his face broke across his cheekbone his nose it's damaged his face disfigured him and that was with one punch got 28 months in prison for that single blow went to prison um it's in Penteville prison and um, um well, it was my job as as I become a Muslim representative of the wing it's called often called a Muslim rep Every wing has one, which is basically during Ramadan, just found a job to do just to burn some time going and giving out the food to everyone that they're fasting, going cell to cell, and prison guard next to me, and then giving out the food individually to each cell. And people were fasting summer 2012. And um, yeah, the prison guard said to me, Can you go back to your cell? I need to count the rest of the prisoners. And this is after lockdown, so while we're in prison lockdown, we had to do. Um, he has to do count, make sure everyone's in their cell. I'm the only person out of the cell at that time with food, a trolley with food. And um, in that moment in time, he said, I need you to go back. And I said, what about the rest of the prisoners? They need to eat. And he goes, no, I'll do a count and I'll come back and open up the cell again. So I'm very, very skeptical about this. Went to the cell and with him and, and went, to the, went back to my cell. And um, he didn't, he, he, no one came back. I was pressing the, the button, there's a button, a panic alarm inside every cell where you press the button to get the attention of the prison guards. And I pressed that button and no one came back and I heard my name getting shouted out in the prison and a lot of people screaming my, my name out. People were getting angry with my food, a lot of these things getting pissed off and I'm like, this, is, this doesn't sound right. So then eventually I pressed that button and then carried on pressing it until they got their attention. They came up to my cell and they basically, the prison guard um, said to me at that moment in time, he said to me that um, I said, Look, I've got a lot of people to feed. And he said to me that um, I'm not going to be let out myself because he's already told all the prisoners gone cell to cell and told them that I've locked myself in the cell with the food. He set me up. And that's why all the prisoners were banging my name. And he was getting angry because they knew that. They had the impression that I had taken all the food out of greed and locked myself in the cell, but I was actually set up by a prison guard. And that's when I realised what the system really was. Wow. But you changed and you came out and you've been doing this work to, to really rehabilitate people. Just going back, how far did, how high up the chain were you in your gang? Well, the people around me were importing large quantities of drugs. And, you know, I had all my friends are either in jail for murder or, you know, serious organised crime. I was pretty much at the top of my, my game. So 
you wouldn't be able to come across me and have a problem with me without running for your life or hiding. So, so you, as dangerous as they come. You weren't doing the importing that was a level above you. Yeah, I was doing the enforcing. And you were doing the enforcing. Um, so you came out of prison. What made you change? What made you change? What made me change was um, that that key moment in time where I was set up by a prison guard. I was in prison. I was dyslexic and picked up a dictionary, I copied Malcolm X, and started to read, read the dictionary, learning words, um, read as much as I could, and then decided to to change my life from that moment in time. The prison guards are trying to get me to fight other people because they want to see this one punch. <laughs> I'm not going to punch anyone. I don't want to do it. And then at that moment in time, I realized that I'm going to do as much as I can to reduce the impact of youth violence and gangs. I mean, at that time in prison, I was with people like Kevin Hutchinson Foster, who gave Mark up in the handgun, which sparked the London riots. So I was around people like that in front of my face and, you know, their, 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 their cases on the TV. And it was a very surreal moment in my life where I knew that I didn't have to be there. I and mean, then I came out of jail. Um, realized that the people that I'd gone to prison for were fake, they were phony, and they weren't genuine people. Um, and, and then I, I came to terms with my life and tried to help others by taking them through a trajectory that I had gone through and um, volunteered for various charities, learned the industry and the sector of how charities work, and then focused on, on starting my own endeavor to help people change their lives. And, and that's when I got a much more um, bigger sense of, of responsibilities and, and roles towards helping other people not make the same mistakes that I did as a young person, whether I was involved with dr drugs, guns, kidnappings, or serious assaults and violence. I just knew that things that I could do was, was much more better with my life and much more productive. So, you know, after seeing a lifetime of crime and being around people that were serious, known, notorious criminals, I decided that I wanted to change my life and always knew that I wanted to do something to help the communities and the young people. Um, I tried to do it with cars and went in, in towards uh, doing it through um, STEM services, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, but that really wasn't um, too fashionable amongst all the young people, but fitness was. So I had this as a garage where I was doing my cars, and having my entrepreneur hat on, you know, my first ever have a business I was 18 years old and I opened up a car chop shop you know you know doing dinging cars over stolen vehicles and stuff and that's how Asians are we're entrepreneurial you know so although it was a uh, it wasn't legitimate it just knew that when I was a kid I just knew that I wanted to do business so I just wanted to work for myself and I was sick of working for other people so I decided um, you know having my entrepreneur hat on when I came out of prison I decided to just do something right with my life and I had this as a car garage, legitimate car garage, and then just changed it into a gym, got into university, doing my master's, transdisciplinary, going on to my PhD, um, challenged people like Tommy Robinson, who I had in this gym, and I was questioning him, and I set him up during the Black Lives Matter movement, and you know, I've really, really set him up. And, and that's something that I was used to doing on the streets as a kid, setting up drug dealers, setting up gun dealers, setting up people that I didn't like. And I used that for the good, and I set up, Tommy Robinson and my questions to him were, and he said, he, I said to him that, you know, why do you hate black people? And he goes, I, I don't hate black people. You know, I'm not racist. And I, I questioned him, I said, why do you dislike Muslims? And he goes, yeah, I don't like Muslims, but you know, I only, I don't have a problem with black people. I only have a problem with Muslims. And my next question was, are you aware that black people are also Muslim? <laughs> I annihilated this guy and it was, it was a real, sense of it was a it was a fulfilling moment in my life to get my own back on all the far-right extremism that i had been exposed to and that i'd been you know, a victim of and i watched my mum be beaten as a child and you know as things that i grew up with and seeing my mum being assaulted when i was a child walking next to her and the racism that was affecting us it was just my moment in time to kind of show and, and you know say that we are much better and we're much better than they think we are not all of us are are bad but we can use our bad narratives to, for good and instant justice and instant karma and, you know and that video he puts his hands up and says he radicalized Amanda and I've got it on tape and I just felt so enlightened by that moment in time to use a bad side of me for good and then keep that good hat on and just 
turn this into a gym and help as many young people as possible and transform people's lives. And now I'll focus on, on academia, I'll focus on helping as many people as possible and just changing people's lives. So yeah, you, you know, if you don't know where you're coming from, how do you know where you're going? So I definitely have had enough understanding of where I've come from. And now it's, you know, during lockdown, I just, everyone was so depressed and I said to myself, what am I going to do? How am I going to help people? My grand opening turned into the grand closure because of COVID-19. And I thought, I need to open this business up and keep it open with sustainability. So I created the world's first safe distance training policy and guidance. And then I just realized that systemic racism is not just, you know, people in the streets or people that go to football matches or, you know, there are there is racism in institutes, you know, in schools, in colleges, in universities, in councils, in police, and everywhere we're looking. And that's when I just realised that my bigger battle is not with the smaller guy on the street that's calling me a P. It's it's actually with with some mainstream institutions that are driving these narratives, and that's why I focused on reducing the impact of extreme ideologies through the countering violence and extremism method and model for sports and gyms so yeah